Hello and welcome to this Noble Science of Defence video. In this video we're going to have a quick look at some of the swords that George Silver speaks of in his work. Of course he speaks of long sword, he speaks of his pole arms, but they're not the things we're going to worry about. Today I'm just going to look at very very briefly some of the single swords, and the main swords that he discusses. To start with, of course, the rapier of inconvenient length. This here is a rapier. This is based on an average of 16th century rapiers. Blade is 45 inches long, so slightly longer than George Silver would mention for the training in the schools, as he does in his book. See the flex is quite harsh, so that it's able to penetrate into the opponent. For the convenience of length, you'll notice here, this does not turn inside of my dagger. Being average, some rapiers will be shorter than this, some will be longer, some will be more flexible. But this is a fairly average sort of rapier for the time. Second, we have the rapier of convenient length. You can see this is essentially a very similar weapon. The hilt design, very, very similar. However, this one does turn inside my dagger. The only argument George Silver comes up with for the rapier of convenient length, it does not have protection for the hand in the garden wall. This is obviously a completely irrelevant argument due to the fact that users of these weapons tend to not to use the garden ward. Although saying that, there are English authors of the 16th century who suggest that you should have a rapier, uh, your side sword should be 36 inches long on the blade and have two rings on the front, one larger than the other. So there are English soldiers who suggest that this is an appropriate weapon. Of course, we then have the English short sword. This particular short sword is a replica of the one found on the Mary Road. It means it's dated to 1545, exactly the right time. I feel that this weapon is not given as much consideration as it ought to be. Convenient in length, strong hilt to protect my hand, and of course, when I'm in my garden ward, it's protecting my head as well. Same if I choose my open ward, I'm protecting my head and my hand. This weapon is carried by English soldiers and English civilians from mid 1500s right the way through until mid 1700s. It's a very common weapon of war for the English at the time. However, the next sword we're going to look at is not mentioned by silver. This is a Highland basket-hilted broadsword. This is the sword that many, many people confuse with this, the English sword, of, the English short sword that George Silver mentions. Problem is, this sword doesn't seem to exist prior to 1600s. It seems to be a result of the Scots court of James VI. When he takes the throne of, the throne of England, he brings his court down to London with him. And then fashions start to change. This hilt starts to become Scottish. 
Scottish have known about this hilt obviously previously, due to the fact that we have been at war with them for generations at this point. So quite why they haven't decided to pick it up prior to that is unknown. In his new method of fencing, William Hope in 1707 describes three types of blades. Those for cutting, in which he places the Highland broadsword, and the cut and thrust, in which he places the English backsword. These are two different weapons. I'm going to do more videos on these at some point. However, it's important to understand that these two weapons, similar as they may seem, are not the same. So, George Silver in his book mainly speaks of the English shortsword. However, there are a couple of points where he references the backsword, and he refers to the backsword as this, the same weapon. So, although this only has Excuse me. Although this has two edges, George Silver still equates this as the same sword as the English short sword. This is a sword that we use at the Noble Science of Defence. This is what we consider the English short sword. There will be more videos on all of these weapons. Uh, in particular, I'd like to go through a lot of George Silver's paradoxes, which of course we'll use the rapier for. We'll look at the mechanics of both the short sword, the rapier, and at some point we'll also look at the mechanics of the broadsword as well, how they all differ. The rapier of convenient length, alongside the English short sword, is a cut and thrust sword. It doesn't mean they're the same. That depends on what you want to do and how you've had your sword made. You can have one of these orientated towards thrusting and make it behave mechanically differently. You can do the same with these, but if you're going according to George Silver's texts, this should be a pure cut and thrust sword. If you want to use one of these, a weapon like this for George Silver's work, again, George Silver wants a pure cut and thrust sword. So it shouldn't really be orientated to either cut or thrust. So that's a short look at some of the swords that I mentioned. Hopefully it's helpful and thanks very much.